Very good. So it's 11 and six minutes. Um, welcome to all of you to the second CU Talent webinar. I am uh, giving the floor to the coordinator and principal investigator of the research project, Laura Martin, who will start introducing this session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juan Ramon. Good morning and uh, welcome to you. Uh, our second edition of our CU Talent Initiative. Um, well, our CU Talent Initiative, uh, it's, um, it's um, an activity included in the, in the research U project that belongs to uh, uh, CU Alliance, uh, in which we are trying to um, disseminate the research of junior researchers. Why? Because we uh, we really think that we can help them to uh, to do networking, to be able to share their research, to be able to contact with other researchers from uh, from our alliance universities, and to promote and to help you in uh, preparing uh, new project proposals and improving your research and uh, and helping for or to um to increase the international impact of your uh, of your publication when uh, participating when serving research with uh, uh, researchers from other nationalities we really think that this initiative um can help you and that's why uh, we really believe in this bottom up uh, way of of uh, of, um, of disseminating research um well um that's why uh, we have um we have proposed different topics uh, initially the project uh, um uh, organize or design um, different um, webinars, uh, but um, but uh, I mean it was stated like uh, like one per year or more or less, and uh, we really thought that it was important to uh, focus in different topic of research that uh, we thought that they were uh, interesting for the international community and uh, try to promote webinars on these topics. That's why, well, we have, uh, this is the second one on coastal management, but there are going to be other ones dealing with uh, health, dealing with uh, with law, uh, dealing with uh, oceanography. And we really, we really would like you not only to participate in attending to the to the webinars, but also to uh, to participate as presenters. It's only twenty minutes, uh, twenty minutes presentation. Um, we are in a very familiar um, ambient, and we really think you can uh, well um, um, enjoy this uh, this initiative. Well, as I said, this is the second edition, the second webinar that deals with coastal management. Coastal management is a very important topic of research that deals with, um, um, let's say, the maintenance of our coastal line. Why? Because I mean, um, there is, I mean, there are many different threats like erosion of la like flooding that could affect our resources, and a uh, no prevention of this coastal line could lead to, um, for example, important important negative impacts in economy and negative impacts in society. And that's why governments and uh, councils uh, are, are performing or are developing um, different um, policies or different uh, uh, programs, uh, not only for research, but also for adapting and, and, and trying to protect the coastal lines. Uh, this is uh, very important for countries that have um, a high 
percentage of coastal line or countries that are uh, um, an island, for example. That's the that's the um, that's the, the the example of one of our presenters, uh, Matthew Agios, for example, no, that uh, that uh, belongs to the University of Malta. Well, today we have two presenters, not only Matthew that uh, that uh, is going to present a research dealing with um, with. Uh, Coastal management in the in the island of Malta in in Malta, uh, but also we have uh, another presenter, Damian Moskalevic, from the University of Dansk. Uh, how is going to be uh, this uh, this webinar? How are we are going to per to perform it? How we are we are going to uh, to work? The idea is to <laughs> have our to our presenters presented that they researched during 20 minutes and then at the end when they they will finish we can uh, open a, a question session uh, so uh, well i'm going to start with the with the first presenter matthew agus and um and um well, he's uh, he's a uh, researcher, postdoctoral researcher at the University of Malta. He's a seismologist. Hmm? He presents himself as, and uh, he belongs to the to the seismic monitoring and research group in the Department of Geosciences at the University of Malta. He's going to present uh, one of, uh, I mean, part of his research that deals with uh, groundwater monitoring in Malta for ambient seismic noise, preliminary results from Sigma project. This, I think this, um, I mean, it's an uh, it's, um, interesting talk that uh, deals with the importance of, uh, of seismic studies to monitor groundwater which is so important in the sort of such an important resource uh, in Malta. So um, I'm not going to take time of the presenters of the most important um, of the most important contribution of this webinar, and uh, I, I would like to give the floor to Matthew Agus. Um, and um, well, and you know, um, you have 20 minutes and uh, we are looking forward to listening to you. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Um, uh, hello, Juan as well. Thank you for the invitation. Can I share the screen? Is that okay? Absolutely. Yes. And is everyone seeing my screen? Is it okay? All right. Um, Okay, so thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, usually I'm, I'm a seismologist and usually I give talks to other seismologists. So, so coastal management is, is something that uh, is not common for me. But actually, it's I, I would say very much related because usually coastal management is um, people think about what's happening at the surface. And with seismology, it would give us the opportunity to look and understand what's happening beneath uh, the surface underneath our feet. And in the case for Malta and probably most countries, the most important resource is, is groundwater. Um, now, the case uh, for Malta is, is particular because it's a very small island. Uh, this project is funded by the Energy Water Agency, which is the national agency in Malta. And uh, because this is a very important resource, basically half of the water that is available for, for uh, potable water for drinking um, comes from the groundwater, and the other half comes from the salination process and, and plants, which are along the coast, and uh, they consume a lot of energy. So there's a, an a impact related to the environment. So understanding and managing our resources um, is very, very important. But first we need to have the tools to do the monitoring. Uh, I would like to mention Luca Laudi, which is a master's student. He's, he's right now finishing his office thesis. I will be showing also results from his work. And the PI is also co-PI is Polingari and Sebastiano D'Amico. And today I will be showing, I hope, um, very nice results. And I hope I will convince you that the technique is, is a very, very nice technique um, um, and that it works. Okay. 
So oh, here's a short video, just a quick introduction. Um, but if you cannot hear or, or miss some parts, I will be talking about this project. So that's a promo video. Um, I will be talking a little bit about the technique. I hope I don't scare you off about the science um, a week before Christmas or a week before Christmas. Um, but my take home message would be that there are new tools, seismic tools to actually um, that we can use to, to monitor groundwater. So what's, what's the situation? This is the island of Malta, it's very small. It's probably one of the smallest or the smallest state in the European Union. The climate is semi-arid um, with very limited rainfall of 500 millimeters. Uh, unlike most countries in Europe, we don't have any lakes, we don't have any rivers. And then we have a very high population density topped up with, with uh, a very high density of, of tourism. Just to give you the numbers, um, the population is about 500,000 and then we get 2 million tourists. So the demand for water, especially during the summertime, is, is very high. Um, and uh, therefore, it's, it's of importance that we understand the water system and find the tools uh, necessary to, to improve our, our monitoring. Um, here's the geology map of the, of the island of Malta. Um, what I would like to highlight from this map is that um, there are these five layers, which you see on the top right. Um, and we will be looking at the lower coralline limestone, which is at the very bottom. Um, but there's an interesting geology from, from the western, northwestern part to the southeast. Um, and this, in the future, will require further, further studies um, because it has its own hydrological system. Um, but today I will be talking about the lowest um, aquifer, which is, which is uh, within uh, the lower, lower layer. For those who are not familiar with the process, um, hydrological process, um, this is a cross section. So this is the previous map and this is a cross section from southwest to the northeast, where basically you have these five layers and you have the infiltration from rain, precipitation, when it rains and, and then it goes into the water system. Um, in Malta we have a very good network of boreholes, which are run by different by, by the by the energy water agency, the water service corporation, private companies as well. Uh, we have a system of galleries, and these are close to the mean sea level. Um, some of them go back um, in several decades. Uh, so the water problem has been identified for many years now, especially when Malta was a, a military island. Um, and these were developed to, to um, extract the, the fresh water resource. And what's interesting um, in, this, in this figure is that you have these lenses where you have um, groundwater and then you have seawater and you have the interaction between the two. And you have the, the, the groundwater, you can see it rising and then going down again close to the borehole. So basically, um, when I'm comparing with the borehole data, I will be comparing with the mean sea level. Um, so this is the mean sea level, and in some places it is higher than expected, and it's because there's more groundwater. Um, so this is a general schematic of, of, of the, the hydrology system in, in, in Malta. Um, going to the seismic part, uh, in Malta we have the seismic national, the, the Malta Seismic Network, which are the red triangles. And it happened that between 2017 and 2018, we had a temporary seismic network. 
which are the orange triangles. And this gives us a nice opportunity to do um, the, the analysis across the island um, using um, so many stations uh, across the island. So, so considering the small size of the island, uh, this, this is quite a high resolution network for, for the size of the, for the island. But in general, uh, the network is are the red stations, which is the permanent uh, seismic network. Um, because of this, we have we had for this experiment we had two types of stations. Um, one is the what we call broadband. Basically, they are very broad in the frequency range that they can sample. Um, this is a typical uh, setup for for such an instrument. You have the seismometer over there and and uh, the electronics set up in in a, in a room. Um, and these make up uh, the national seismic network, which are the red one. And then we have the, uh, in this case, we have these simple, uh, more basic uh, instruments and setups where these were deployed for the temporary network. I'm highlighting this because part of the experiment was um, what type of instruments are able to detect the groundwater. Um, these type of instruments and setup costs um, a couple of thousands, like about 15, 20,000 to set up, whereas these ones are much cheaper, less than 5,000 euro, and uh, they are easily deployable. So if you want an instrument somewhere, you find a quiet place, you, put, you need the electricity and a and, and place where, where to, to leave it quiet, and, and that's it. So part of the experiment was to also compare these two types of, of instruments, whether we need sophisticated instruments or, or, or less sophisticated instruments. Um, a little bit about seismology. This is a typical seismogram uh, that we usually uh, people see when there's an earthquake. And usually these instruments are used to detect earthquakes. And this is an earthquake waveform. So, so when there's an earthquake, seismologists look at this part of the waveform uh, to analyze the earthquake. But in this study, we are actually looking at what we call um, uh, ambient seismic noise. So basically, um, in between earthquakes, the instrument is still recording, and it's still recording the, the vibrations of the ground. Um, and usually, this type of data is disregarded, um, thought that it is not useful. Um, but actually, uh, the examples I'm going to show is, is making use of this ambient seismic noise um, which actually there are signals in it. And so the question is, where does the signal come from? The signal for the ambient seismic noise, they are the, the vibrations in the ground, which are, we call them micro um, And these are caused by the coupling of the ocean wave energy with the seafloor. So, so the sea um, is always moving, is, 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 is there are waves in the sea and, and the waves are hitting the coast, are hitting the, the ocean floor. And these generate um, these what we call micro and these are a signal. Um, the signal is, is lost in this noise, is, is, is part of this noise. And the analysis that, um, that we, we do um, is basically using the frequencies related to, 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 the, to the noise generated from the ocean waves. So basically, our source of energy is free. It's, it's out there, especially we're, we're a small island, we're surrounded by the sea. So we have a lot of the signal. Um, and in this experiment, basically, we, we use the, the, the signal, we analyze this signal um, to, to, to understand what, what we can detect from, from, from this data. Okay, um, I promise you uh, two or three slides of, of theory, um, but I try to keep it simple with cartoons without any equations. Okay, so imagine we have a seismic station here, um, the, the black triangle, and this is the rocks. Um, and the rocks, um, they can be saturated with water or not saturated with water. With water. So here, for example, where you see the blue, you have pores with water, saturated with water. And in this case, there's on top of it, there's no water. And we get what we call a corollogram reference, which is a seismic signal um, for this environment. Let's assume it rains a lot. And so now the, the rocks are saturated with water. As you can see, the blue now is, is filling more the, the air pockets. And we get a slight shift in the signal, um, in the correlogram. So in the seismic signal, we get a slight shift. Or the, the other way around, a slight shift in a, in a different way. If there's, um, there's no water, if there's a drought, and there's less water in the rocks, we get a slight shift in the signal. And the slight shift is in, in time. So this is why you see DT. So it's a reference in time um, uh, to the reference signal that we have. 
And this technique is using just one station. We call this autocorrelation. In another method, okay, here are the, the examples. So pore pressure increases, the grain contact decreases, so the seismic wave speed decreases. Or in the other way, if the pore pressure decreases, then the grain contact, the contact in the rocks increases, which will then help to increase the, the seismic wave speed. And the other technique is what we call cross correlation. So in this example, we have two stations. So here we have detector one and detector two. There's noise being recorded at this detector and there's noise being detected in the other detector the, uh, station. If we do a correlation, a correlation is a, is a mathematical function to tell us how similar the signals are, we get um, what um, the correlation signal, the choreogram reference. So the two techniques are either using one station um, or using two stations, where basically we take um, the, the, the data, the seismic data, and we correlate the signals uh, to see how different they are from each other. And because there are these sea waves, the ocean waves hitting on the ground, then you have a very uh, regular signal. And if it's recorded on one station, it should be recorded on the other station. So there is a signal common between the two. And the correlation function gives us a mathematical, we call it impulse response, um, of how similar these signals are to each other. Okay, um, this is the seismic coverage. So before I show the, the seismic stations, which are the red and the orange ones, and if we are combining the two station methods, so we need two stations, then it gives us a lot of coverage because we are pairing the stations together from one station to the other or the other station with, with the other. So, so this gives us a very nice coverage across the island. This is the data availability we have from 1995 and then in recent years, the network operation, uh, more stations were added. So we have a lot of data in recent years. These are the choreograms that I mentioned before, um, the, the difference between the two, this is the reference choreogram. And so we compare each day with this reference for each pair of station. Okay, um, and then there's some mathematical technique to compare the, the reference with the observed. What I want to highlight is that the difference is so small that they're actually on top of each other. And when we're talking about the delay time difference, the time difference between each one, we're talking about very small numbers like 0 0.02. So it's a very weak signal, um, but it is a signal, it is there and we can use it. And from time, we can then convert to, to velocity, assuming the, the crust in the velocity in, 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 in the rocks. Okay, let's go to the results. Um, so what you're gonna see here is, is a map on, on the top left. The blue, uh, the, red, the orange triangle is the seismic station. MC, that's the one we have on campus next to uh, my office right now. The green dot is the borehole data. So, so it's what you see here. And the blue dot is the meteor, the, the precipitation of when it rains. So basically this graph is showing three things. Um, the green is the borehole data, which you see here above the mean sea level, okay? The blue is the precipitation, how much it rains over the years. So the x-axis is the, the time uh, over the years. And the red is what we measure, the, the, the bold red color is from the, the velocity changes that we detect from seismically. And what you can see, the, the blue shade is the winter time and the white is the summer time. So in winter, we, it rains a lot. The borehole data, you can see it increases. And in summer, there's less rain and the borehole level uh, goes up. And if you look at the red data, which is the seismic data, it's what's new, what we are providing. There's some very nice agreement um, between the winter and summer and winter. You can see there's some agree good agreement with the borehole data, especially if there are some peaks um, and, and the new oscillation. So I hope I can convince you that this technique is, 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 is very, very um, good. And we can, I'm going to show the next examples are different examples showing, showing these. So note the seasonal variations with the winter, uh, blue shade and the summer um, in the next slides. Okay, this is another station. This is Schlendi, um, seismic station. Uh, we have the borehole also in Gozo and the Meteor uh, station in, in, in the, in, in, on the island of Malta. And you can see similar patterns. So, so in, in winter, the, the values go up. In, in, in summer, the values go down um, as expected. So, so, so this, is, this is very, very exciting. Um, in the station for the one we have in the south, the data goes back to 1995. So the borehole data that we have goes only up to 2016, 
But with this technique, we can actually go all the way to 1995. So we can look at the seismic record and look at the groundwater um, levels. These are some more examples um, to, to give you an idea that, that it works. I'm going to go fast forward, basically, in these examples. Um, here I'm using two stations. So this is the station in the south and the station in the north. And you can see the very nice pattern um, matching with a borehole uh, located midway between the two. Keep in mind that the locations might not exactly agree kind of with the borehole because it's, it might sample different areas, but the patterns are there. All right, I'll, I'll go fast forward here. Um, okay, so what's next? So we know this technique works. We can develop it further, uh, especially in the future. Uh, we can look at the coverage. So here we can plot at different time and, and we can see the, the, the paths um, between the stations. So we get this national coverage. We can do techniques um, like seismic tomography. This is still a work in progress where basically we can find a mathematical model and that fits all the paths across. And so this gives us a nice map uh, changing over time, day by day, um, uh, of, of the, the hydrology system in Malta. So this is work in progress. And we can also think of, of other, other techniques um, that can use seismic data to help us understand better the hydrology of the island. OK, um, food for thought. Um, so the stations that I showed are, are on land. But there's nothing um, holding us back except for funding and um, to put stations in the ocean. Um, so we assume that the fresh water is located onshore, um, but it would be interesting if there is fresh water beneath the sea. And it would be interesting if there is dynamics like changes, seasonal changes beneath the sea, because when it rains, it rains in the sea. Um, so we don't know what happens then. So probably it's lost. Um, or maybe not. So, so it would be interesting to see if any link between the water that it rains on land going all the way, whether it's connected on sea. And this we can do by putting stations in, in the sea. Of course, we need funding for this. At least you need to leave the ocean bottom seismometers um, at least for one year. Um, but it will increase the coverage substantially. So now it wouldn't just be on land, but actually we can extend further. Uh, for example, with three stations, if you put five stations, the coverage will, will increase further. Um, we should consider putting a seismic station in the north of Gozo uh, over here, because you can see we're missing a lot of information on this part of the island. So this is food for thought. Um, I hope that uh, the take home message is there are new techniques. Um, we should not also look at coastal management at the surface, but also understanding what happens beneath um, our feet, especially when it comes to resources. And um, uh, there's opportunities to, to, to investigate offshore and link what is happening onshore with offshore as part of a, of a coastal management system. All right, um, these are my conclusions, and I would be happy to answer any questions that uh, you might have after the next talk. Thank you very much. Matthew, very interesting. Right. I already have some questions for later. <laughs> All right, thank you. Okay, well, that now is the turn of Damian Moskalevic from the University of, uh, of Dansk. Uh, he's an early career researcher and lecturer, lecturer at the Faculty of Oceanography and Geography at this university. Um, He's going to present um, some of, of his results or of the research that he's performing that is entitled to be or not to be. Can we support coastal management with geological experience? I really think it's, uh, it's a very interesting uh, talk since um, um, it proposed a very challenging uh, a research approach in which uh, um, tries to integrate um, different um, topic of research, geological approaches, methodological approaches, and oceanography data in order to be able to predict or to, uh, to analyze uh, which one is which one are the the um, 
the contributions of uh, natural hazards, stream natural hazard events when monitoring uh, coastal areas. Well, um, I, I give the floor to, to Damian and um, well, we are looking forward to listening to you. Thank you very much. Hey, hello everyone. Thank you for the introduction. Hey, I will try to share a screen. Okay. Do you see everything? Yes, yes, we okay, can. Perfect, thank you. Uh, okay, so today I would like to show you um, some idea uh, which aims to involve uh, geological archive in coastal management. Uh, the presentation will cover three um, topics. Um, the first one will be a perspective of information that we get from geological archive um, related to coastal flooding. And this topic is related to the ongoing research project that is finishing uh, this year, next year actually. Uh, and the second part of the presentation will be related to the new project that uh, just uh, begun. And at the end of the presentation, I will also uh, try to um, show uh, what we are looking for and uh, what is the challenge we want to deal with uh, in the in the future. So here on the photo, you can uh, see a part of the coast of the Polish coast, the Baltic Sea. Uh, the coastline is built with uh, cliffs, uh, with sandy barriers, and also coastal wetlands. So this is the effect of one uh, of the seasonal storm events a few years ago. Uh, that shows uh, that parts of our coast uh, are endangered with um, coastal flooding. So the motivation uh, to using geological data uh, is the limit uh, of the time span uh, of the other kind of information. Uh, so we have a very nice uh, data on instrumental record uh, up to 200 years. Uh, we have some historical archive uh, that goes for the past uh, 1,000 years, uh, but we don't know what is uh, in the longer time span. Uh, do we have any information about uh, some um, hazards that may occur in the coastal zone? So the first step of our study was to uh, check the chronicles, uh, to look at the old photos, aerial photos, uh, older maps, also uh, drawings by artists, even sculptures uh, in the churches. Mm -hmm. And all of this uh, contains some information about the events that occurred in the past uh, that destroyed partially or totally uh, coastal infrastructure and that led to um, a lot of uh, drones in our regions. Uh, so uh, yeah, so the first question was uh, which of these events uh, were recorded in the sediments uh, in the geological archive. Uh, so we investigated uh, study sites along the southern Baltic coast, mainly in Poland. Uh, uh, here you can see uh, all of the sites that were investigated in the past years. Uh, and some of them showed the potential to, um, uh, to contain a sedimentary record uh, with a time span longer than a few hundred years. And these sites, mainly coastal wetlands, uh, were treated with uh, geological techniques to get uh, some information about past coastal uh, flooding. And what we can find in the sediments in general, the first thing is the geometry of the deposits that uh, are formed during the flooding, also changes in the coastal morphology. And the direct evidence of post-coastal flooding uh, related in this case to uh, storm deposits 
are sediment layers, sandy layers that uh, cut the pit deposits that occur at each specific site. So if there is no coastal flooding, we expect to have uh, pit deposits in the coastal wetland. But if any event of, um, of uh, flooding occurs, it may lead to erosion of the base of the pits, uh, transferring, moving some parts of this bed uh, through the water and then uh, deposit it later in the form of uh, rip up clusters. Uh, we can also expect uh, changes in the sediment composition. So the one of the thing we are looking for are changes in grain size distribution. So we investigate the diameters of each particles uh, that occur uh, in such layers and also below and uh, below and uh, above uh, these layers. We also investigate surrounding areas like dunes, uh, beaches, offshore deposits, and check uh, if we have any specific signature that could uh, be interpreted as a event uh, layer and not um, some soft changes of the uh, sediment influx uh, just uh, behind the back barrier environment. One of the signatures we are looking for are also heavy minerals and their compositions. These are minerals that have very high uh, specific density. So if they, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, so if we have a high, higher content of uh, uh, specific heavy minerals, we also can uh, expect, we can interpret that we had uh, higher energy conditions that led to a formation of um, particular uh, sandy layer. Uh, there are also some biological proxies. Uh, in sediments, we can find uh, foraminifera, diatoms, uh, which are direct evidence of marine inundation, marine inflow to the coastal wetlands. Uh, however, sometimes they are not preserved, they may be dissolved, they may be eroded, and we only have a paleo DNA signature, and sometimes even this information is also uh, missing. Uh, and there is also a most basic indicator of uh, sediment input to the coastal wetlands. Uh, this is uh, changes of uh, organic matter content in the profile. So if we have a decrease of the marine organic content, uh, we see that something happened. It can be an increased uh, influx of eolian deposits, but it could also be re related to uh, coastal flooding. And we need to use other proxies to uh, interpret uh, the sediments properly. And there are also geochem geochemical signatures. Uh, so the influx of uh, particular elements that can be also interpreted as a marine uh, inundation. And here's a view, uh, more detailed view on one of these proxies. So on the left side, you can see uh, heavy minerals that occur in uh, storm deposits, but also in surrounding areas. The key is the uh, assemblage, actual assemblage, and the proportion between minerals of different shapes and different uh, specific densities, uh, which could point on high energetic events that occurred in the past. Uh, so for example, here you can see two types of storm deposits. The one that was the result of uh, inundation at the coastal wetland. In such layer, we have higher content of heavy minerals in general, and also a bit different uh, assemblage that in the uh, in the pit deposits uh, above this uh, layer. And on the right, uh, the result of overtopping the dune uh, deposits. Uh, so not that high energetic event, but uh, more like uh, frequent uh, inflows related to a storm surge that uh, comes somewhere near the top of the dune and moves part of the sediment just to the back barrier uh, environment. Uh, and in this case, uh, we have a much uh, more uh, complicated situation. However, uh, with comparing this assemblage, which we find uh, in the score to the surrounding sediments, we also saw that uh, these storm deposits uh, are characterized by a bit different um, minerals contents. 
And now, the one of the cases found in the Rogovo site, this is the middle part of the southern Baltic uh, coast. Uh, in one of the churches, we found uh, the sculpture uh, that showed some kind of uh, flood that occurred in the past. And the in important thing in this case is that uh, the stone deposits were found uh, up to the one and a half kilometer uh, to the land. Uh, they contained microfossils of marine origin. Uh, we dated, uh, actually colleagues dated uh, um, deposits that uh, occur below and above these uh, sand layers. Uh, and that gave a possible time of formation of these deposits. And it was correlated with the event from uh, 1497, uh, the most catastrophic coastal flooding that occurred in the southern Baltic coast. It was very severe three to four days storm event. And that led to break of the sandy barrier and moving the water uh, to the land. Mm. And this, this site is very important because uh, if we uh, check risk estimations related to instrumental data that covers around 150, 200 uh, years of measurements, uh, we see that the limit of possible inundation ends within the sandy barrier. So we have uh, 200 years of the, of the data and uh, it says that there is almost no risk of flooding uh, this area. Uh, however, in the drill checker record, we found uh, one very severe evidence of coastal flooding, and there were also few layers related um, to other events that occurred just 500 years ago. So it's not that long ago, uh, because the history of the coast is even longer, up to a few thousand years. Um, uh, so um, yeah, so this is this is an important note that uh, sometimes uh, we find evidences of coastal flooding that uh, should not that we should not expect uh, according to um, usually used uh, coastal management methods. Uh, another site uh, from Mechelinki. So here we found a very nice. Uh, a record of past coastal floods. Uh, over 25 events were recorded in this area. Here you can see contemporary overwater sediments related to storm deposition just behind the uh, beach and behind the initial uh, coastal dunes. Uh, we took cores at this coastal wetland um, and found out uh, a lot of uh, evidences of past coastal floodings. So this is how it looks under the microscope. So we have uh, um, we have three types of deposits. The type one is the less affected deposit. It's a pit deposition with a minor admixture of sand. We have partially transformed uh, influence deposits of type two and also type three, which we interpret to be uh, events that occurred in the past. Mm, and this interpretation, of course, uh, was not uh, done only with looking at the sediments. We used all of these uh, proxies, which I mentioned uh, earlier. So uh, grain size analysis, geochemical signature, microfossils, uh, and so on, heavy minerals. And uh, this is the final interpretation that these layers are actually re related to uh, storm events. So this core was also dated, and it allowed us to interpret the history of the coast in the time span of a few thousand years. So by comparing uh, contemporary surface, by comparing uh, deposits that we found in the core, by using dating, uh, we interpreted uh, the evolution of the coastal zone, and we interpret that we had two periods of very frequent coastal flooding that occurred uh, a few thousand years ago and that occurred in the past few hundred years ago. And here we concluded that the, one of the factors that influenced uh, coastal flooding uh, was, uh, uh, was the um, presence of the well-developed 
uh, sandy barrier. So this is interpretation from the uh, geological point of view. Uh, and we believe that uh, high sediment availability that uh, the natural occurring uh, coastal barriers are important factor, in fact, uh, to preserve and to protect the coastal wetlands from the uh, flooding. Okay, so this is, this is what, we, what comes from the past. And now uh, we want to get more detail into geological deposits. Uh, we would like to compare uh, the yearly forming, seasonal forming geological deposits in the coastal uh, wetlands uh, with actual storm surge parameters, uh, water levels, waving, and uh, any other information that we can achieve. We also want to uh, study in detail morphological response uh, to storm surges that are occurring uh, in this region. Uh, so this approach uh, uses two things. The first, we want to uh, use uh, multi-beam echo sounder, uh, a drone uh, equipped with multiple sensors, uh, and also surface sampling to give a very detailed view on uh, barrier morphology, seabed morphology, uh, coastal sediments. Uh, we also want uh, to acquire uh, information um, about storm surge parameters, and then to uh, find a new approach that will allow us to combine all these things together. So the first step of this new project that we just started is to uh, take a closer look to morphological response of the storms and morphological response and uh, morphological features of, of uh, our coasts. Uh, so uh, here you can see examples of the data that we acquire. So these are data of multispectral camera, LIDAR, uh, imaging, uh, we also use uh, MBS. Uh, we want to improve also classification models uh, on the features that appear in the coastal zone. And when we get this, uh, we want to uh, establish a very ambitious thing. Uh, we want to check uh, detailed, uh, detailed uh, features of sediments that are forming each season in the core and then to compare this with uh, meteorological data um, uh, about the events that occur uh, during this sediment formation. So to do this, we need a core that is few years, at least few years old. We need to find a proper method to uh, have an age control. Uh, and then we need to compare, evaluate the information that we have in the sediment to the cores that we are using uh, to give a basic information if we had a past coastal floods or what was the uh, approximated uh, magnitude uh, landward extension of, uh, of uh, sediments that formed back. Uh, and if we have a good correlation of some of the proxies of these detail, uh, detailed uh, features of the sediment, then maybe we will be able uh, by calibration to look deeper in the core and uh, recreate, reinterpret geological information in terms of instrumental data. So not only uh, talking about uh, frequency of the storm events, uh, but also to get uh, any information about uh, possible the magnitude. Uh, this approach have a lot of challenges, uh, so uh, so it will be very interesting uh, to study to research. So um, and this will be done in the future years. Uh, we are uh, just at the uh, beginning. So what we would like to achieve in a few years, or even in fifteen years or more, uh, is to link geological records to instrumental measurements. Uh, and uh, extend the information that you get uh, from standard methods uh, to longer time series and try to integrate this data uh, for the purpose of coastal management. 
the main idea uh, was inspired by deposits, by research of the lake deposits, uh, where uh, uh, at the moment, uh, researchers that deal with uh, lake deposits, yearly laminated deposits, uh, are already stop talking about past climate transfers. They start talking even about weather changes in the past because they have extremely high resolution uh, in their sedimentary record and they are already working on calibration of information from sediment trap from the cores uh, to recreate conditions that occurred uh, in the past and that was the main inspiration and this is the main idea for uh, my uh, future research uh, so uh, there are also uh, threads that we want to uh, apply uh, to measure our, um, to use our uh, measurements in some quantitative ways to analyze some possible scenarios in terms of uh, changing of um, coastal morphology. And uh, we believe that uh, the modeling of the coastal zone using uh, well known uh, methods, well known models will be also useful. Uh, to combine uh, standard coastal management techniques with the geological archive uh, that we already have and we study uh, in detail at the moment. And that's it. So here are some contact details. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Damian very interesting research, very challenging. It's very interesting how um, um, there is a relation between historic news regarding um, stream uh, events and the process that you have measured in the different areas. It's uh, very interesting. Well, so, um, Thank you very much to uh, Matthew and to Damien. And um, if it's all right for you, we can start with the round of questions. Is there any questions in the, in the chat or if you prefer just to, I mean, um, react with your hand asking for a turn? Well, I can start myself or Juan Ramon, is there, are there any questions on the chat? Well, uh, at the beginning of, the, uh, of uh, Matthew's presentation, Godfrey Baldacchino asked a question related to the possibility of having a seismic station in the north of, of Gotho in, in Malta. I don't know, Matthew, if you want to, to go deeper into, into that issue or... Yeah, uh, no, it's... Um, uh, the, the challenge mainly is, is the logistical challenge um, in the sense that you, you need to find a site. And it's not just finding a site, that it is well maintained, that you have services like internet and, and uh, electricity. Um, also, if it's a, for a permanent station, ideally it would be on good geological um, uh, rocks. Um, so this so far has been the challenge, um, but uh, hopefully in the future we will add more stations, particularly in the north of Gozo, uh, where clearly on the map it was it was like um, part of it missing out. So so it's it's in the in the in some of our, in our thoughts. Unfortunately, it's there's no station yet. <clears throat> thank you thank you very much uh, Matthew there is also one more question for you on, on the chat Ariel Thomas just uh, wrote is it possible to derive groundwater flow rates from the seismic station data for example estimating SGD if you have offshore stations okay so this is um the next step kind of of what needs to be done because first of all we need to relate the variations that we see in the seismic velocity 
um, we need to quantify it in actual volume of water. So although I was showing relationships with the borehole, it was more intended to see that the changes we see in seismic velocities relate to what's happening in the groundwater. But actually, volume of water, um, uh, we, we are not there yet. There are ways to try and establish this. For example, if, if there's a site where there would be replenishing the aquifer, like pumping in water, then we know exactly how much water they're pumping in. And then we can quantify the changes in seismic velocity. Now, to the question of uh, offshore, yeah, ground, uh, as opposed to drive groundwater flows from seismic area, for example, if you have offshore stations. So, in the case of offshore stations, we don't know what to expect because uh, onshore, we know the process it rains, the rocks are uh, unsaturated, and then they get saturated. Probably beneath the sea, the rocks are always saturated. We, we, we don't know, um, and, and this would be part of an investigation, whether the seasonal variations we see on land are linked to the ones uh, with groundwater offshore and how far offshore are they related to. Um, the advantage of this technique compared to other techniques is that it can give you a time series, so we can see the changes over time. Um, unlike other techniques where it would just give you a snapshot, for example. Um, so this is this is room for more studies. This is very new. Um, to highlight how new it is, the technique has been um, used next to rivers or next to, to lakes. It has never been used to, to islands such as Malta, and Malta is very small, so the dynamics being so close to the sea or surrounded by the sea um, also has its own characteristics. So it's all new. So if any of you or your universities are interested to investigate into, into this research, there's room for collaborations, uh, especially, for example, offshore stations. Uh, we don't, uh, as a university, we don't have ocean bottom size monitors. So we definitely need to collaborate with other universities to uh, help us or rent out uh, such instruments. So this is all new. Uh, it's very exciting. Another advantage of the technique is that you don't need to drill. So unlike a borehole where you need to go and drill, you just leave an instrument. So if you go offshore, you just leave the instrument uh, uh, offshore. Um, and then you go and pick it up. So so um, these are the main advantages. Like cost-wise, it is, it is more advantage, uh, more efficient in this way. So it's all new. So these questions, thank you for the questions, um, but it's still unknown answers. Thank you very much again, uh, Matthew. Um, I cannot see any any more questions on, on the chat. So Laura, if, if you wanted to, to pose a, a question yourself, feel free to, mm -hmm. to do so. Well, uh, I have a question for, for Matthew. It's not um, my topic of research, and maybe, um, I don't know, the question is um, a little bit out of, of the topic, or maybe it's a question that is a nonsense, and I and uh, I should know it. So, but in any case, uh, I just wanted to know if, the, if with the seismic approaches, you can uh, identify the volume of water that is uh, of groundwater, and if you can identify if the water, if you have salt water or fresh water, because with the sea with the sea level rise, there is a lot of contamination of groundwater, uh, or fresh water from uh, groundwater's uh, uh, deposits uh, from from the marine water. So, uh, so I mean, I don't know if it is. It's, it, not, it doesn't make sense, but um, it's my question. <laughs> yes, thank you for the question. It's a very important question, especially if we can detect uh, fresh water or, or, or uh, saline water. Um, so in principle or in theory, um, using different techniques, not necessarily the one that I showed, um, in theory, you can uh, detect it because um, they have different densities and different um, contrasts that can be detected seismically. But the reality is that the difference is so small um, that probably it would be hard to detect. Um, there are different techniques, which I didn't go through them today, and that they might give a clue. Um, but my answer would be that it is very difficult. So what we can actually detect 
is changes in the in the uh, pore pressure in the rocks, which decreases or increases the seismic velocity. And this is why I was comparing to the boreholes to give us um, an idea, a relationship of, of water, volume of water. The correct or better way to do it is that if you are pumping in water, so, so and there are aquifers which are recharged by pumping in water, um, then you know exactly the volume of water that you are pumping in. And then you can detect the change in seismic velocity. Unfortunately, these have this such a re, um, replenishing of the aquifers has not been done or it's not being done in Malta yet. Um, in other countries where if you have a lake, for example, then you can quantify the volume of water or how much it rains. The problem to use rain as a, as a, as a quantifier is that you get runoff. So if it rains here, the water might end up somewhere else. So it's also hard to quantify that if it rains here, that drop went into the rocks and it's right underneath your feet. It's more likely that the water goes somewhere else. So these are the challenges, but um, we want answers, right? So your question is a valid question. We want answers. So this is room for, for more studies. Um, the way forward probably would be specialized localized studies. So there wouldn't be an answer which fits to all regions. Um, so, so if we in Malta we want to do something similar or get quantifications, we probably need to do a local study specifically for for the uh, region, or or even even Malta has is made up of three different islands. The northern island uh, probably has its own system. Uh, so, um, this is why the the national agency is funding this type of research um, to come up with new ideas of of. To answer such questions. Okay, thank you very much. And do you think that your research could have to to use this groundwater in a more sustainable way, in a more efficient way, in the sense that maybe could be, um, I mean, the water could be extracted in a period of the year, not to. Um, reduce too much the deposits, I don't know, in which way this could help for a better sustainable extractions of, of groundwater. So I suppose in the case for Malta, um, the water is monitored quite well. Um, the reason is that we have a long history in, in, in uh, using groundwater because of historical limitations. Um, and um, so, so locally, um, this new idea or new technology um, can be used maybe for areas or maybe offshore which are not explored. But in the case for Malta, a lot of parts of it are, are explored or understood. Um, so I think the exciting part is going in new places where um, there's no information or limited information especially maybe in, in other countries where water is, is more scarce um, and, and you want to uh, monitor things in, let's say, in a, in, a, in a cheap way rather than drilling boreholes and maintaining the boreholes. Um, so, yes, I see this technology as being uh, used um, and it is sustainable because to operate a seismometer doesn't take a, a lot of effort. You can have a solar panel running a seismometer. And you can have wireless internet transmitting the data. So um, efficient wise and, and, and environmentally friendly uh, way. So it is sustainable. Um, but I see it um, developing in areas where there's less knowledge and there's more scarcity. Um, so hopefully yeah, this is new. Um, researchers have been experimenting with this um, new tool and that's what I'm doing as well. Uh, so we'll see what happens what happens next. Okay, thank you very much. Do we have more questions and Ramon? As far as I can see, not uh, not uh, any other questions seen in the chat apart from, from some interventions, uh, in this case by our <clears throat> colleague Aldo Drago. I hope you are very well, Aldo. Uh, remarking 
for outlining the the need for for intergenerational research groups uh, where uh, younger academics and and older senior academics may may take advantage of, of each other's strengths in terms of experience on the one hand and willingness on on the other hand so apart from that no uh, no other questions it's uh, it's 12 uh, 11 this uh, this event was initially planned as uh, as a one hour event so uh before anything else i i want to i want to say thank you to our to both of our speakers for this additional time they are uh, giving us away i don't know if uh, if either someone else may have any other question or any of our speakers would like to to add anything else to to everything that have been said so far may i ask the last question is a curiosity for damian yes yeah. yes i mean with the course that you have um, sample um well, taking into consideration the the velocity of uh, of sedimentation, you can find out uh, the period. I mean, uh, and, and you can you can associate every single layer with the period of time. No. Uh, in yeah. general, yes. Uh, not each layer uh, um, is useful for. Uh, age approximation okay. so we carefully sample this core and take the sediments that uh, that have signs that it would be useful for dating and usually we have at least several uh, sampling points in each core and if uh, a core has a lot of layers if it uh, if deposits uh, meet the standards uh, for dating then we sample uh, such core uh in denser intervals uh and after that we get uh dates for uh let's say seven ten samples and then we have to uh build a depth match model and then we can say uh when these uh storms or other events that uh formed uh, such layers uh, occurred uh, in the past so at the end we get information of possible range of time when the event occurs. So this is uh, not a particular age, but more like uh, the, the age with error or the range of the ages, because uh, we always have um, fragmentary sedimentary record. It is almost impossible to have uh, full complete uh, information. There's also some erosion. Uh, excuse me, some changes of the sediment after the deposition. Uh, so it, it may be challenging, but in favorable conditions, we are able to build that age mod uh, model and also estimate when the particular uh, event occurred. Which one has been the la latest date, the latest year? Uh, in one of the sites we had the record from around 5000 years ago uh, however if we go deeper and more back to the past uh, it is uh, more difficult to say that this information is valid uh, it's uh, yeah it all, always contains some kind of error and uh, interpretations so okay. these dates we have closer to the um, to the present are much more reliable in terms of uh, estimating uh, occurrence of the events in the past, but it's still uh, useful information. Okay, thank you very much, Damien. Very well. Um, another participant on, on the chat has pointed out uh, that EU coast actions provide a great opportunity for for collaborations between uh, senior and, and early career researchers, as, as Aldo has, has previously mentioned and has included a link to, to the set call for proposals. So thank you very much. 
And uh, well, thank you very much once again to to the speakers, to participants as well for being with us to and to help us promote science and, and European science. I don't know, Laura, if you want to say a, a few words before ending this, this event. Well, just to thank everyone, thank uh, the presenters and thank a lot uh, also the, the, the people attending the webinar because uh, without them, this can this initiative cannot go on, and uh, well, and um, I um, I just um, let you know that uh, that uh, you can follow us in social media. That uh, we have uh, an Instagram account for research of our alliance, research you, and um, and well, that that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much and stay tuned for the next CU Talent webinars of the of the CU Alliance. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you.